Good morning. My name is Bob Hendershot. I teach world history here at the college. And I want to welcome you all to the opening session of the Social Science Department's Women's History Month Symposium. We have three excellent events planned this week. And it's my pleasure this morning to introduce our first speaker, GRCC history professor Susan Williams, who took her Master of Arts at the University of Cincinnati, <clears throat> specializing in modern and early modern European history. She's about to finish her PhD at Indiana University in Bloomington, where her focus is modern East European history and the history of gender and sexuality, with a minor in Russian and East European studies. Her dissertation is very interesting as well, and it focuses on Romani nationalism in Romania during the interwar period and on how a Romani, a modern Romani identity was constructed during this crucial time. She also deals with how and why the West constructed the idea of the gypsy in their imaginations simultaneously. She has had great fellowship funding from very prestigious organizations such as the Fulbright Organization and the Mellon Foundation. And she's conducted years of extensive research based primarily in Bucharest. She's also built a very impressive record of publication with recent articles appearing in journals such as the Anthropology of Eastern Europe Review and the Journal of Romani Studies. Next fall, she will be offering a new course here at GRCC and a very important course on the history of gender and of sexuality. The, his, the course code is HS225 and you should all take it. Right? It's very important. And, uh, but today, she's presenting her paper titled Dreadful Novels to Feminist Lit, A History of the Romance Novel, which promises to be extremely interesting and to provoke, provoke uh, many excellent questions and we'll be following the symposium format this morning. So if you would, kindly hold your excellent questions for a Q&A period at the end, and we'll pass the microphone around at that time. So please welcome Professor Susan Williams. So thanks for coming today. We're really excited about having, uh, in the Social Science Department, to be able to have a, a symposium this year that's, that's bigger than last year's. We had one speaker last year, and this is our, uh, we have three things going on this year. So I hope you guys can come to more things uh, in the, today and, and tomorrow if you have a chance. Um, so I guess I should say, uh, you know, one of the reasons that I was interested to, to study romance novels, because some of my students said, my god, why are you writing a paper on this, right? Uh, they're horrible. They're dreadful. And so uh, I should say that, uh, you know, one of the reasons that we study popular culture uh, as historians, it's part of a, a movement that comes out of the 1960s, 1970s, uh, where, uh, you know, studies of representations of popular culture, they weren't part of the traditional story, right, the traditional histories. Uh, traditional history tended to be a top-down approach. I was concerned largely with power and progress, economics, politics, right. And, and the idea was that that's the way you do history um, through the, the mid-20th century. So the reason that we now discuss popular culture is also a, for the same reason that we celebrate Women's History Month. During the 1960s, uh, new movements emerged in history. They called for new approaches, interested not just in the great men, in other words, white men, right, um, in history, power politics, decisive military battles, right, uh, but, but a more, more inclusive story. Uh, narratives that historians would call history from the ground up. Um, and it was through this approach that historians began to construct a history of everyday life, a history of that everybody else in society and their impact on the historic narrative because they indeed did have an impact on that historic narrative. Um, and so studies of popular culture, like studies of the romance novel, studies of Family Guy, studies of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, right? They're all done. Uh, they fit neatly into this movement. Um, they help us to understand people. Uh, and in order to understand people, you have to try to get a grasp on their culture. And by culture, we don't just mean ballet and opera. The majority of us don't go to that regularly, right? Um, or great works of literature, we can enjoy them. But there are other pieces of literature that we enjoy, right? There's escapist literature, like I'm going to talk about today. And, so, uh, and we also study things like baseball, rock and roll, right? popular um, comic books popular literature, and romance novels. So uh, urging the movement on in the 1970s and 1980s, uh, when we draw this in with Women's History Month, there was a growing understanding that there was missing voices, um, 
in the historic narrative. And uh, part of that was the poor in general, right? Part of that was the working classes, but part of that was women as well. And so Women's History Month um, came about in part to recognize and recover the contributions that women have historically made. Um, we want to bring them back into the story. Right? So it's due to the work of female academics in the 70s and 80s that textbooks began to change um, and that women began to be represented. We're not done yet. Um, Women's History Month is still relevant. It's still important. The end goal, like things like Black History Month and Women's History Month, uh, is to create a historic narrative that naturally refre reflects the diversity of the human experience. Um, but you just have to look at, at current textbooks for a variety of subjects currently being published um, to realize that these, uh, these months, Black History Month and Women's History Month, they haven't lost their relevance. And so what better way to look at Women's History Month than through the romance novel? Um, it's a quintessential genre of popular literature largely constructed by women for a female readership. And thus, it can tell us something about women uh, from the Middle Ages on. So I want to I ask a question before I get started. How many people here will admit to reading a romance novel? Raise your hand. OK. Not many of you are going to admit it. How many of you have a friend of a friend that have read a romance novel? Mike Light, apparently. So, uh, <laughs> so and, and you know, Romance novels, it's a bigger genre now than it used to be. I don't just mean these Harlequin or these Avon romance novels that are, you can buy on supermarket shelves, right? Nicholas Sparks, who's seen a Nicholas Sparks film or read a Nicholas Sparks book? That's a whole new genre of romance novel that actually has male characters as the lead character, right? What we call male romance novels. 20% um, of the readership of romance novels currently are by men. Um, so this isn't a genre that just affects women. Um, so, I should start off by telling you why I'm interested in doing this, besides just as a historian who's interested in popular culture, besides the fact that I like to avoid my writing my dissertation at all costs. Uh, but I, I got to tell you a little bit about myself to tell you why I'm interested in romance novels. Now, I grew up in a little town outside of Cincinnati, grew up in a working class family. My mom was the daughter of a chicken farmer uh, from Appalachia who came up during the southern migration in, uh, in the 1960s. My dad was a farm boy from Eastern Ohio who joined the Marines and then became a truck driver. We were the quintessential working class family. Um, and uh, you know, during my adolescence, my mom was a stay-at-home mom. She got a job a little bit later on, but uh, maybe for seven or eight years, right? Uh, but you know, one of and we also weren't an academic family. That's one thing I want to point out. We didn't have discussions of great literature around the, the dining room table, right? Uh, you know, our books in our house consisted of an old set of encyclopedias published in the late 60s, uh, and piles of romance novels. They were everywhere, right? They weren't something to be hidden. You didn't put them in a drawer. They were piled up on every available space because that's what my mom liked to read. Uh, there were scads of them. They were everywhere. They were falling over on you as you walked through the living room. She bought at least a dozen a month. Um, and I have to say, you know, she, uh, it, it, I should say, you know, she figured out pretty early on, I love to read. Now, romance novels were off limits to me, right? Uh, when she found one under my bed one day, she actually came into the bathroom and said, Susan, one thing that you need to know, sex is something that happens between two very married people. My sister and I are still very confused about the whole very part of that, of that whole uh, agenda, right? Uh, we still joke about it. But uh, the romance novels were off limits. Um, but she made a deal with a local bookseller, used bookseller, that in return for her sitting at his desk occasionally and doing his books, she could bring in all of these old romance novels, and in return I could get any books that I wanted. And so my education, my early education, was because of the romance novel. Right? I didn't go to a great high school, but I loved to read. And I grabbed any kind of book that I could out of there. I read everything from Herodotus to Nancy Drew anything that I, could, uh, that I could get my hands on. And it was because she made this deal, right? Because also she had dozens of them to turn in every, every, uh, every month uh, that I could read as much as I wanted to. And so, uh, so this year, I started to actually think about this period of my life. And I thought about how important those romance novels were to her. And then I started thinking about, well, you know, I want to explore this topic. And I want to think about not just my mom's generation, uh, but where these things came from and what they look like over time. 
And so I should say, just to kind of set up what we're talking about, I mean, the romance novel is a huge genre. Uh, Harlequin, which is a leading publishing house, a Canadian company, leading publishing house of romance novels, sells four books a second in the United States. Uh, when economic times get tough, like they are right now, those numbers are skyrocketing, right? This is escapist literature. Uh, it's a genre written primarily in English-speaking countries. It's translated into over 90 languages. There are different topics uh, that sell better in some countries than others. For example, people in Eastern Europe refuse to read paranormal romances because nine times out of ten they start off talking about Dracula and the Carpathians and they just are tired of hearing that story, right? Uh, Italians hate cowboys. Now you would think this is a country of the Spaghetti Western, right? Clint Eastwood. Unfortunately, they don't seem to like them very much. Right? Um, and so, so different topics sell in, uh, better in uh, some countries than others. Harlequin uh, receives 20,000 unsolicited manuscripts a year by, uh, by writers. Right? Uh, publishes 120 books a month with 1,300 writers on their payroll. Um, they sold 131 million books in 2006 alone, with 50% of them selling overseas. And the new ebook market uh, that's growing, gosh, every month, I mean, that's creating whole new publishing houses that don't publish in print, right? They publish everything on online. Uh, and their numbers are increasing as well. So just to give you a general sense about how this changed, in the 1980s, romance novels totaled about $300 million in sales, with a readership of about 20 million people. Most had some college education. 40% were employed full time and 60% read one romance every two days. In the 1990s, their sales accounted for 40% of all paperbacks sold in the United States. 50% purchased 30 plus novels um, a month. Not a year, a month. So this no these numbers steadily increased. 2004, romantic fiction made up about $1.2 uh, million in sales. The genre made up about 39% of all fiction published that year. Readership was split about 50-50 between married people and singles. Uh, and as I said when I started this, new voice in the mix. 22% of the readership is now male. 64 million people uh, admitted to reading at least one romance novel in 2004 alone. So why do people read romance novels? Now the genre itself, we've got to kind of construct what the average plot is for all of you who won't admit to reading one. Um, the main theme is about the development of a romantic relationship between two characters. That's the basic plot line of every romance novel, right? Any conflict in the climax of the work relates to this development of this relationship, while short subplots can stray outside of this focus. And finally, a romance novel absolutely must end happily and optimistically. It is, after all, escapist literature. You don't want it to be a downer at the end, right, when you're trying to escape from life and escape from bad economics. So girl meets boy, or in the new industry of Nicholas Sparks, right, male romance, boy meets girl. They develop a relationship under some stress or trial, and in the end, love conquers all. So to start our discussion, I want to focus on a topic, and that's love. What is love? We don't think about it that much, right? We just accept what love is. But love is, you know, modern concepts of love. This comes out of the Middle Ages. Um, romance novels are part of a very long tradition of literature, romantic literature in Europe. Now, as I always tell my, my HS 101 students, love as we understand the concept comes from chivalric literature. Um, starts out of the French courts in the 1100s. And it was this, this period that medieval courts became obsessed with notions of what we call courtly love. Now, best expressed by Andreas Capellanus, the author of a treatise that he called About Love. This new concept of love focused attentions away from issues of partnership and procreation. The church had implemented, right? You only have sex for procreation. When you get into a marriage, it's a legally binding agreement that protects the issue of that procreation, right? That marriage was supposed to be a partnership, and you were supposed to come to some kind of understanding, a mutual understanding together, relying on that partnership. So you don't say, encourage love in a marriage before this period. But rather, you're supposed to just have a nice partnership, right? A business relationship. Uh, that you can be fond of the person, but love is something that leads you astray. That's the idea. Many a king who seemed too fond of his wife made fun of in courts during this period. It was something that supposedly weakened you. And this changes in the 1100s. And just to give you, you know, 
the concept that Capilanus is trying to get through in his about love. Um, you focus away from that partnership and procreation, and you, you turn that focus onto passion, purity, beauty, and a civilizing factor within love itself. Love makes one weak, need, and emotional. It makes you faint when you see your, your love. Right? It makes you jealous. It causes you to lose sleep and stop eating. Uh, it's all consuming. It's irrational. It's civilizing. Here's, here's a little quote from, a couple quotes from Capilanus. Love is an inborn suffering, proceeding from the sight and immoderate thought upon the beauty of the other sex, for which cause, above all other things, one wishes to embrace the other and, by common assent, in this embrace to fulfill the commandments of love. Love, amor, is derived from the word hook, amar, which signifies capture or to be captured. For he who loves is caught in the chains of desire and wishes to catch another with this hook. Just as a shrewd fisherman tries to attract fish with his bait and to catch them with his curved hook, so he who is truly captured by love tries to attract another with his blandishments and with all his power, tries to hold two hearts together with one spiritual chain, or if they're already united, to hold them always together. This is the effect of love. That is, the true lover cannot be corrected by avarice, by greed. Right? Love makes an ugly and rude person shine with beauty, knows how to endow with nobility even one of humble birth, can even lend humility to the proud. He who loves is accustomed humbly to serve others. Oh, what a marvelous thing is love, which makes a man shine with so many virtues and which teaches everyone to abound in good custom. So. The women in these stories um, were placed in an odd position. Women were ennobling and moral, and thus being in love contributed to a man's betterment. And what we have coming out of the French court during this point are ballads, songs, stories, right, that push this idea of courtly love. And as I said, women are put in this odd position. You're ennobling, you're a civilizing factor, you're a moral force, yet women were also supposed to be put on a pedestal. They were perfection that would be spoiled by contact. So it's no coincidence uh, that these concepts of courtly love, they come at the same time that the cult of the Virgin Mary begins. And just like the Virgin Mary, women are supposed to be put up on that pedestal. And if you bespoil the Virgin Mary, she's no longer pure. Right? The same with these women. You can't take her off that pedestal. So courtly love itself is a schizophrenic concept. Um, it's rational yet irrational, passionate yet pious, spiritual yet earthy. Yet here is our basis for modern love, um, which is probably why there's so many self-help books out there, right? Uh, promote jealousy. Love is monogamous, but flirt and love on the side. Love means changing, thus bettering yourself. Love causes a physical reaction, heart palpitations, fainting, paleness. Right? Love is completely focused, yet passion must be reined in. Now, our first romances come out of this period. These troubadours, these wandering balladeers, they travel all over the French countryside. They spread these ideas of courtly love. Other people pick it up. It spreads throughout Europe. Um, they're singing these songs. They're espousing these new virtues. And so the literature of the period elucidated on this concept of courtly love. So most famously, our understandings of King Arthur come out of this period. King Arthur before the 1100s, this is just a post-Roman king in England who cuts off a couple of people's heads in, in one tiny part of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles. But people grasp on to this story, and they make it into what we think of when we think of, of King Arthur. Right? Suddenly, there's this stoic king with these young men surrounding him, these knights, right, who owe him allegiance, who are all having love affairs. Lancelot and Guinevere, right, the ultimate love triangle. True love ruined by her marriage to King Arthur. Right? Passionate love, love that you'll do anything for, right? love that creates jealousy, love that makes you civilized. Right? Because just Guinevere being in the story makes them all act better. Right? They try to be civilized for her. Um, and so, Crescent de Troy um, explored courtly love and concepts of chivalry in his reworking of the Arthurian legends. Now, it, as I said, it turns kind of the struggles of a post-Roman king into a love saga. Right? 
Um, and this also includes, for anybody who saw the movie uh, Tristan and Isolde, right, that came out a couple years ago, uh, tr they're part of his, his stories. Right? Um, and so uh, Thomas Mallory is actually going to take Troy and all of his writings, and he's going to expand on them in the 15th century in a book called The, De the Death of Arthur. Arthur sorry. Um, and it's going to be reprinted and reconstructed throughout the 20th century. And Hollywood's going to take Thomas Mallory, um, make romances for radio, film, and television out of it. Right? So you can see the long spread of these ideas. Right? They just keep coming back into culture and re-influencing our ideas about what love is. So in most of these ballads, if we step outside of the King Arthur legend, um, there are other stories featuring Charlemagne, Roland, uh, his knight, even Alexander the Great. Um, but one of the things that we see in these early romances is women are not the main character. Part of that is because of the fact that the majority of women could not read. Uh, the, main, uh, the main people who are reading the prints of these, of these stories uh, are men, right? And so they like their action. And so women tend in early romances not to play a very big role. They're not even mentioned that often. There's an understanding that the men are on a quest to impress the woman. There's an understanding they're being civilized by this force that's outside of the book. You know her name, but she's not really in there. She's not a real character. She's not developed in these stories, right? And so we also see these, uh, you know, the theme of romance affect people like Shakespeare, The Tempest, The Winter's Tale. And again, it, it, it keeps up with the theme of action. All of these stories for Shakespeare are set in dreamy fantasy worlds, um, where the focus is on action above the focus on the affairs of the heart. So the romance is in the background of these stories, right? But it is the force that's propelling these storylines forward. His most striking tragedy, however, of course, is Romeo and Juliet. It's not even one of his romances. But it's something that most of us have at least heard of. And it's going to be strangely a model for romance. Star-crossed love, complete with family conflict, uh, would inform tragic works of literature. Uh, but remember, the readership we're looking at today doesn't want star-crossed love to end in star-crossed love. Those stars better realign by the end of the book to make sure those two characters get together. Now, the genre of the romantic novel itself as fiction, um, with women in mind, comes out of the 18th century. In 1740, Samuel Richardson wrote a book called Pamela. Uh, the whole title is Pamela or Virtue Rewarded. Now, this story of a lower class maid named Pamela and her slow and arduous courtship, it's two volumes right, that I slogged through last week, uh, with an aristocratic squire named Mr. B, because you can't give out full names in these stories. That would apparently make it too complicated, uh, is the work many hail as the first modern romance novel. Now, this work is, is written from the female character's point of view. Um, it focuses on the relationship between the main characters, and it ends happily. Two volumes it takes to end happily, but it ends happily. Now, its themes were wildly romantic for its period. Love between a maid and a squire. Uh, people of vastly different social classes was at best frowned on, and at worst, it could actually lead to social destruction. So it also had the dark tones alluded to in its title, Virtue Rewarded. Pamela constantly rejects Mr. B's untoward advances. Um, he starts off just trying to ruin her reputation in general, right? trying to sleep with her. When she turns him down for that, he actually tells her parents that she was having an affair with a local man, um, and that he, not to worry that he was going to put her in hiding for a while to save her reputation. So he kidnaps her, which is charming, but it's a device that, that's used in almost every, even in the modern period of romance novels, kidnappings. It's atrocious. I mean, there's a rash of them in these things, right? Um, but he, uh, so he tells her parents this. He kidnaps her. He threatens to marry her off to another. He tries to convince her to be his mistress. And the whole time, she's being very virtuous. This is not me. I'm a good girl. Right? I have to protect my virginity. Uh, and so he keeps trying. When she finally refuses to be his mistress, he admits that the only thing preventing them from marrying is the social gap between them. But he does indeed love her. And once he realizes how much his behavior has tormented her in volume two, uh, he decides that he must marry her. And she decides, after attempting to leave him, that she does indeed love him. Her trials, however, are not over. After they marry, the family rejects her. And in doing so, um, 
they tell her about a, an affair that he had with another lower class woman because apparently he was a serial predator uh, with whom he had another child. Um, in the end, they rediscover his child who is living in some poor abbey in the countryside. They find out the mother of the child has, has left and is happily living in, in the Bahamas on a plantation and she's now wealthy as well but apparently not wealthy enough to claim her child. And, and uh, they claim her. They make, Pamela finally makes a good impression on the local gentry and on his family. She agrees to be a good, respectful wife. Um, they, have, they have to have a conversation about her, her roles, right? And they live happily ever after. Virtue, indeed, has other rewards. Now, the book might not have been a critical success, but it was a public darling. Uh, there was a whole multimedia event around it. Uh, you could buy playing cards, fans, uh, playing cards with, with little uh, quotes from the book on it, uh, fans, prints for your house. There was even a waxwork exhibit in London where you could go see the wax characters, right, from the novel. Preachers started including references to Pamela in their sermons to teach about virtue. There was even uh, a number of satirical responses, the most interesting being an apology for the life of Mrs. Shamala Andrews by Henry Fielding. Um, he was a very, very well-known um, satirical novelist. He wrote the book Tom Jones, if any of you heard of that. In this story, the heroine is portrayed as a money-grubbing social climber who pretends to be a virtuous woman in order to lead poor Squire Booby uh, into matrimony. This response is interesting. Given the primary storyline and its historic background, um, Pamela, a virtuous woman, represents a class of society typically scorned in this period by the aristocracy as well as the middle class. She's part of the working class. And as a maid, Pamela, had she been a real person, would have been working in a very dangerous situation. She's working in a household led by a single man. Um, and young women were often lured into sexual situations by their employers in this period, whether by rape or seduction. And once their quote unquote virtue was destroyed, they were often cast aside and fired, particularly if they got pregnant as a consequence of the liaison. Thus, Pamela must protect her virtue and in the end is rewarded for it. In Fielding's response in Shamala, right, uh, the story is one of a working class woman who schemes to climb social ranks and that women use a veil of virtue in order to lure unsuspecting men into their marriage trap. Pamela, in fact, was a sham. Two different views of men and women and their relationships of one another. Men then should fear women and their nature. Under a thin veneer of virtue lay the heart of a monster that preyed on unsuspecting men in Shamala. For fielding, women were prey and thus had to be protected. In, for fielding, women were prey and thus had to protect their virtue, their true treasure at all costs. So it's interesting. Um, it's also interesting what happens after the first publication of Pamela. Richardson actually decides, he, he's had a lot of critics, people said, well, you know, I don't like this aspect of the novel or this, so he gathers together a group of women, and he has conversations with each edition that he's going to put out about changes that they would like to see. So we also see the beginning of marketing of romance novels, right? He's actually taking a poll and seeing the changes they would want to make, he makes the changes, uh, and then he reprints another edition of it. And the changes themselves are really interesting. What we see is that Pamela herself changes. She no longer speaks in the later editions with a working class accent. Thus, the shock of her marriage uh, to this country squire was lessened for the reader. Now apparently a member of the lower middle class, Pamela would, be a, would only have to climb just a few rungs on the social ladder, thus preventing social anarchy, apparently. Now another person you might not think of as a romance novelist that you might have come across before in the least of film is Jane Austen, very popular romance novelist. Right? Um, she wrote a number of works for the middle class women uh, interested in, in romances in, in Regency England. Um, still popular today, she, prevents, she presents a very dignified portrait of English country life right, for the lower gentry. Um, these, people, these women were happy, healthy, witty individuals looking for romance. Now, Pride and Prejudice was first published in 1797. There's a number, of course, still in publication today. It's her most famous novel. Um, explores the theme of family, the importance of family, and their impact on your, on your social character uh, while following the quintessential romance formula. Girl meets boy. Girl is generally annoyed by boy. They slowly build a relationship. 
There's a horrible catastrophe that strengthens the relationship, and then girl and boy marry. It's only with Mansfield Park um, that Austin writes about a poor relation, Fanny Price, um, who isn't guaranteed happiness in the end. She's just close enough, that lowest rung of, of middle class society, she might not be able to marry the man of her dreams. And so thus, in the end, that happy ending, it's even happier, right? She finally gets the, the man of her dreams. Um, love prevails. Right? Now the romance genre itself really comes of age in, in Victorian England. Printing becomes cheaper during that period. It's easier. There are technological innovations that can mass produce, like the steam press, right? Um, that can mass produce books, and produce them cheaper, right? Mass transit itself, trains. Gives you, you know, creates the need for cheap throwaway novels uh, so that, you know, you get on at one stop, you read your book quickly, you can throw it away at the end, right? You buy another one later. So, the, you know, the, uh, the period also penny dreadfuls, right? You buy a penny dreadful, which is basically a precursor to a comic book for your kids. Um, buy it at the train station, they can read it on the way, you throw it out when you get to your destination. And so, Another thing that happens in Victorian England is that women actually become uh, a target for marketing. Um, this is the first time ever that, that actually they, they, are, they and children become a focus of marketing. And so thus, they become a market for novels. And there's a dramatic increase in this period in the number of romance novels published. And most of these novels that are published during this period, they're written by women. So these new novels uh, actually start to explore darker topics. You move away from that happiness in the Jane Austen world. And Jane Austen herself, I should say, tried to write a gothic novel. It was a miserable failure. Uh, but occasionally, if you, if you know your Jane Austen, she'll, they'll perform plays in their houses. And the plays that they perform are often some of the gothic romances that are written in the period. Right? Um, so darker topics, dangerous and tantalizing underbelly of London, fog-shrouded streets, dark alleys of Edinburgh. Remote houses on the moors replete with secrets of love, loss, and murder. Uh, mysteries to be solved. This gothic novel, a new genre, explored tragedy, violence, jealousy, and passion. Now, the basic formula remained the same, yet suddenly heroines were faced with challenges that encompassed the known and the unknown, the supernatural, right? Um, scientifically created monsters. Frankenstein, right, is part of this genre. Ghosts lurking by windows and in dim hallways, tragic secrets hidden away. Wives in remote rooms in your house. If anybody's read Jane Eyre, right, it's part of this tradition. Uh, Wuthering Heights, Heathcliff, and, and Catherine's ghost on the moors knocking at the windows, right? This is one of these books. So in the face of adversary, uh, adversity, our heroines did not break, however. They're faced by all of the supernatural world, uh, but they go on. Um, they did not part with their morals, but rather, as we saw with Pamela, uh, they remained true to themselves and were rewarded with the fruition of their love in the end. In a period where women, particularly middle class women, were increasingly confined to the domestic sphere, such fantastical novels provided solace as well as escapism. Um, you know, titillating, passion-filled adventures could be found for these ladies within the pages of the romance novel. So, the most uh, popular author of this period was a woman named Mrs. Radcliffe. Anne Radcliffe, she was a daughter of a shopkeeper. Her mom, you know, was, was a part of the domestic sphere. She stayed at home. Uh, she, she, uh, Anne Radcliffe married a journalist, pretty well-known journalist. Uh, they had a, you know, they didn't have any children, couldn't have children, and so she started writing as a hobby for herself, and then her husband encouraged her to try to get the books published. And she's, she's really well known for this genre. She's the pioneer of the Gothic novel, right? Everybody read, men and women, read Mrs. Radcliffe during this period. Now, her heroines often find themselves in mysterious castles on the moors, haunted not only by ghosts, but by mysterious barons and other nobility, right? Uh, these mysterious men who they'll ultimately fall in love with, right? Um, now, her publications uh, included such works, I'll give you some titles, A Sicilian Romance, The Romance of the Forest, The Italian, uh, and the ominously named The Mysteries of Udolpho. Um, 
described his critics by as, you know, the, this is where I get my title from. They describe her novels as dreadful novels, right? There's something that rots the brains of everyone who reads them. Uh, her works were wildly popular, as I said before. For Radcliffe, supernatural events were rationally explained as natural occurrences. Yet her style played up the Victorian passion for terror and the bizarre. Uh, Radcliffe's stories focused on an isolated female who desperately holds on to her, to her morals, right? Uh, who, uh, you know, who overcomes an inordinate amount of trials until finally she makes her way back home and marries the man who deserves such a virtuous woman. And of course, all of this are all these plot devices. They go on and on. You know, she'll get out of one scrape, and then she'll get kidnapped. And then she'll get out of one scra scrape, and she's almost raped. And then she gets out of another scrape, and then there, she's confronted by a ghost. And then she gets out of another. And it just goes and goes and goes until finally, about the last three pages, she, she manages to escape. She you know, finally finds her lover again, and then they're happily, they live happily ever after. Uh, and Radcliffe underlines what's interesting. You know, one of the big complaints about romance novels has always been in the 19th century it was, oh, they make women act silly. Women are already silly, right? And they just make them act sillier. And that's why, you know, you should have some edifying works like the Ladies' Home Journal for them to read. That way they can focus on embroidery and, and watercolors and the things that women need to know. And, uh, and, and you don't turn their heads with this silliness, right? Um, and so. As we go on, of course, we'll talk about some other critiques of it. And so for Mrs. Radcliffe, it's really interesting. They always, you know, for a lot of people, they say, well, romance novels, if you look back at the history of them, there's something that just kind of supported patriarchy, right? They supported kind of the structure of knowledge that said women were weak and men were strong. Um, but we don't really see that all the time. And, and I think that's why more and more people are getting interested in taking a look at romance novels, right? Um, so for Radcliffe, she underlines the need for women to act rationally in a period where they always talk about women have sensibility. Women, you know, women act emotionally. That's how women react to things. And here you have a, a, a woman writing for women who says women have to act rationally. Uh, in the Mystery of Udolpho, the heroine's father gave her the following advice. Above all, my dear Emily, do not indulge in the pride of fine feeling, the romantic air of amiable minds. Those who really possess sensibility ought early to be taught that it is a dangerous quality, which is continually extracting the excess of misery or delight from every surrounding circumstance. And since in our passage through this world, painful circumstances occur more frequently than pleasing ones, and since our sense of evil is, I fear, more acute than our sense of good, we become the victims of our feelings, unless we can in some degree command them. Ration and reason, often categorized as masculine in this period, must win out over emotions and sensibility, the supposed feminine traits. Women then had the ability, according to Radcliffe, to command their feelings, to be rational. It is only through this capability that her heroines make it out of their trials. And yet, as they marry at the end of their novels, it is as if once they fill, had their fill of adventure, they too pass into the domestic sphere just as her readers did when they finished the last page of the novel. Romance novels continue to flourish during the 19th century, but it's the 20th century where these really take off, particularly mass-marketed paperback novels. In the 1930s, during the height of the Great Depression, publishers noted the demand for cheap escapist fiction. Now, Mills and Boone, which are a big British publishing house during this period, uh, had already noted the growing interest for romance novels during World War I, another period where you need that escapist fic in Europe, right? Uh, they began to focus on the publication of hardback category romance novels. Category romance novels being typically about under 200 pages. They have a very simplistic plot. You're just supposed to feel happy really quickly right, by reading them. Um, they're like literary crack, right? Um, Another, uh, you know, another, uh, and uh, for those of you who like silent films or know anything about the history of film, um, an, uh, one of the major romance novels published in 1911 was a book called The Sheik. And The Sheik was a story of a very dominant alpha male who forces himself, he rapes the heroine when they meet. Um, she is attracted to his overt masculinity and thus falls in love with him. The work sold 1.2 million copies it was made into a famous film starring Rudolph Valentino. Rudolph Valentino was the 
male silent film star. The Latin lover was his nickname. He dies of peritonitis, very early age, I think in his late 20s. There was a, a couple of women who committed suicide when they heard about him dying. That's how attached they were to Rudolph Valentino and, and the, the, the characters that he played in film, particularly this one. This was his most famous film. Then he did a, a, a movie afterwards called The Son of the Sheep, right, to just build on this franchise. Now, rape fantasies were often used during this period to explain, and they're going to continue into the 1980s, um, to, uh, as a, they were explained by publishing houses that they were an attempt to sell premarital sex to readers. Uh, but in many works, including those written in the 80s, the heroine is betrayed during the rape by her own body, her own body's responses. Thus, the idea seems to be that her soul understands that the man is her true love, and her brain just hasn't caught up yet which I think makes a statement about what people think women are, right? uh, that, that we are very emotional and we're not rational, and so therefore we can't make that judgment call about rape. Um, the message to women, of course, is terrifying at best. Right? Um, now, Mills and Boots and Harlequin, which is a Canadian publisher during this period, uh, during the 1930s began not only to market to vendors, uh, but to offer popular subscription services. So if you were really busy and you were a stay-at-home mom, you didn't have to go to the store, the bookstore, to try and find these things, right? They could just ship them right out to you. You'd get a selection every month. Um, so, and it guaranteed your supply for the month, your supply of drugs for the month, right? Uh, the heroines of the 1930s set the standard for the decades to come. Young, I mean, a lot of them, if you read these novels, it'll be talking about a heroine that's 16, right? And a virgin, of course. Young, beautiful, pure. I, they were often uh, independently wealthy, and if they were employed, they were employed in what was seen at the time as traditionally female occupations, secretaries, nurses, teachers, governesses, things like this. Now, the fact um, that middle-class female characters are working at all in these novels is a new trend, um, and it reflects a new woman's movement, is what it was called during this period. Um, the readership was now comprised in part of working women. And they, it had to reflect that, right? They have to be able to, to feel themselves in that novel. And so for the most part, the majority of action in these works, um, with a few exceptions, just to burst your bubble if you think there's sex going on in them for the most part, uh, typically the most action people got out of these was a nice chase kiss at the end, typically at the marriage altar. Um, the modern romance genre, the paperback romantic novels, launched in 19, uh, about 1972 or so. Kathleen Woodowice's The Flame and the Flower, which was a historic romance novel set in the 18th century, and it could have been published in, in, the, in the early part of the 20th century. I mean, it's basically the same kind of storyline. It's set in England and the American South. They travel all over the place willy-nilly. Uh, it's a very, very convoluted storyline that includes pop, plot points uh, like the main character is raped by her love interest, but then she decides later on that actually it was her body betraying her, and she just didn't understand they were having sex. She thought it was rape, which is strange at best. Uh, she, she, uh, she's almost raped by a variety of other men during the novel, and of course the hero is constantly saving her. There's a, a murder, there's a couple of robberies, there's a pregnancy outside of marriage, there's a number of fights, uh, and the two main characters hate each other until about 20 pages before the end when they decide that they're in love with each other and they decide they're going to live happily ever, ever after, right? You have to have that conflict for love to finally triumph and feel triumphant. So in the midst of the women's movement and calls for equal rights, one of the most popular books of the year was one in which the hero always saves the day. Uh, the work sold over 2 million copies in the United States. And one of the things we have to talk about with romance novels, uh, one of the critiques that come out of them, is they do uphold patriarchy, right? That they, they're presenting a view of the world and of society in which women are soft and men are dominant, right? And that men will always come in and save the day. What I would say is because this is, uh, you know, mass marketing of romance novels, these publishing houses read all the fan mail. They're constantly paying attention to what women want. They're very slow to change because they're worried about losing money. But when they're forced to change, they do change. So what we start to see in the 1980s is a shift to more independent female characters in response to complaints that their readers are making. Right? Um, so the genre itself grew during the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, the mass marketing of romance novels, uh, in part, you know, not just talking to women, but also figuring out a place, where do you put romance novels? 
place, right? Where's the easiest place to find them? As I said before, my mom every Friday was like, we have to go to the grocery store. Because one of the problems with romance novels, once they sell out, they're sold out. They're not going to do a reprint of them. They only, for, for these uh, smaller romance novels, ones under 200 pages, they throw them out. They pulp them at the end of the month, right? They rip the front covers off them just like they do magazines. Uh, send them back, right? So you're not going to ever be able to read that book. So you've got to make sure to get down to the grocery store on Friday afternoon and pick up those books because what happens if all the other ladies get there first and you don't get to read them that week, right? So you've got to make sure to get the pick of the, uh, pick of the litter. Um, so you put them in grocery stores. You have these subscription services. You encourage new readerships. And they also try to maintain this readership. They, they bring out dozens of new titles available from a, a single publishing house each month. I think um, in, the, in the height of this, in the 80s, you had over 100 books coming out from publishing houses a month to sit on these grocery store shelves, right? Um, so it's in the 1980s that some new themes emerged that, that move away from that strict traditional sense of Radcliffe and Austin. Um, and this trend's going to continue through the present day. And as I said before, you know, it's during the 1980s that publishing houses slowly began to change. Uh, not only the rule that heroines must be virgins, that used to be a rule before the, the mid-1980s, um, but their general avoidance of, of uh, explicit sex scenes. One of the complaints they were getting from their female readership is they wanted more sex in their books. They didn't want something to end with a chase kiss. They wanted action, right, if they were going to go through these things. And so they responded to this critique. Um, and I think that we can link that directly to the sexual liberation movement in the 1970s and 1980s in the United States. And so, all of these changes, they're largely due to reader demands. Um, as a genre that depends on marketing and particularly on the loyalty of its audience. If you have a subscription service, you are dependent on loyalty. Uh, romance publishing houses, they change slowly, yet they are very committed when they see that marketing surveys and fan mail, uh, a lessening of the number of subscriptions, uh, demand change. And these changes uh, reflect the changes in the mores in society in general. And it's during the 1980s, this is the golden age of romance fiction. I mean, who's heard of Fabio before? Yeah, exactly. You shouldn't know who this guy is, right? Uh, this guy is just famous for one, butter commercial. Well, I'm sorry, not even real butter commercials, but uh, I can't believe it's not butter commercials. Isn't that the one he's in? And, uh, but he, he became famous because he was the most famous model on romance covers. Right? Wildly popular in the mid-1980s, late 1980s. Um, so he becomes household names. There's some other models that become household names in that point. Um, the, the, you know, the term bodice ripper comes about during that point. The, uh, these covers right, that you see in these, uh, in these grocery stores with the woman whose chest is hanging out and her bodice ripped open, right? This is a term that, that tends to be dubbed on to, to romance novels in general. And it's something that modern romance novels are really trying desperately to get away from. Uh, so over time, the genre itself broke into a number of formats. There's categories I've talked about before. It's very formulaic, 200 pages or less, pared down storyline reflecting only the essentials. Um, and these essentials are actually decided by the publisher. So if you're going to write for the genre, you have a lot of limitations. And then there's single title romances. They're 300 to 400 pages long. They're not destroyed at the end of the month. Um, they're not as constricted. Their work tends to be more detailed, um, and also they tend to focus a lot more on the development of the relationship. And then these two formats are broken into a number of categories, a few of which, of course, there's historical, which I'll talk about a little bit in just a second, um, contemporary, mystery, paranormal, something that came out of the 1990s, fantasy, inspirational, time travel. There's a, there's a ton of, of subgroups. And so, uh, so uh, you know, I want to focus for a second on the historical romance. Well, I'm a historian. There was no way I was going to read the contemporary ones for this paper. I want to be constantly amused. Uh, by, by historical romance novels. And so, uh, and I should also say I, I had limitations that I put on myself when I, when I started taking a look at modern romances from the 90s and the present day. I, I, my readings are very Eurocentric. I'm a European history professor. I do not read about cowboys. I do not read about the Civil War. It drives me insane. Uh, but, you know, Vikings and pirates, I'll totally read about, right? I'll get down with that. Uh, Regency barons, you know, aristocracy. I, I find it vastly amusing. 
And one of the things that's important to remember is historic novels and films, they're, you know, they're writing about a period of time, but they're really reflecting our time. Right? They're reflecting things that we want in the modern period, not the period that they're set in. And so historic romance novels are interesting to me because I find it fascinating how writers have to twist historic details, have to twist the background, have to twist the social reality of history in order uh, to appeal and soothe modern sensibilities. Bathing, for example, uh, in these novels is quite problematic. Now we know, and I tell my students, that bathing is not high on the list of the um, average everyday uh, lifestyle of the medieval person. Right? Uh, you were lucky to, you know, if you had a water, decent water supply, and you had the time, you might get a bath a month. There were people who, you know, took baths a day. Sure, if you had servants and you were a noble, you could do that. Not many of them did. Uh, there were people who prided themselves on only bathing twice in their life. Right? Uh, so how do you make a stinky Viking appealing to a modern day audience, right? There are a number of plot devices you can make. You can make him like to swim. Um, or you can just decide that all Vikings bathe, right? Which is, which is how they have, to, they have to twist these plots. Um, how do you deal with, uh, with attitudes about women? The, the majority of, of men wouldn't have taken a woman's opinion seriously if she tried to inform him how he should conduct his business affairs like they do in these books. Uh, they were seen as the weaker sex. Sure, plenty of examples in history where men did take women's opinions seriously, but it's pretty rare, and that's not the common teachings of society prior to, to our period. And so how do you deal with this? Right? There are things that you have to twist to make your modern audience more happy. So these are some of the things that I've seen recently. And you know, like I said, I started this off thinking, I remember my mom's romance novels that I wasn't supposed to be reading, but I did anyway. And uh, God, I remember a lot of rape storylines. I remember a lot of kidnapping storylines. I remember a lot of times where the woman gets kidnapped, she has to be saved by the man. What do they look like now? And they have changed. Uh, a lot of younger writers coming out in the past maybe four or five years have started to twist this genre around. And they're reflecting society as they want it. Their utopian idea of history right, is their utopian idea now. And so what I start to see, fewer rape storylines. Uh, women can be sexually experienced. There are a number of these new books where suddenly it's not just that the woman had a husband that died tragically, but that she actually had affairs. Right? And she's perfectly OK with the fact that she had, that she had uh, affairs outside of wedlock. Um, a lot of the times, these women aren't 16 anymore. They're older. They're in their mid-20s to late 20s. They're not virgins. Uh, they sometimes have a couple of kids. They don't have to be pretty. I mean, that the romance novels of the 80s, my god, the descriptions of the women, right? She had waist-length hair and violet eyes, and she weighed three pounds, and, um, and <laughs> she, you know, she could sing like a lark, and she was multi-talented, and she, she could paint, and they could have been in museums. I mean, it's just outrageous. So what we see are, are women who seem more like us right? um, in these works. And so, uh, and the men aren't always pretty either. Now, it used to be in the 1980s, Fabio, right? All these women are thinking about Fabio when these write these guys. I mean, all of, all of medieval Europe and Highland Scotland and pirates and Vikings all looked like Fabio when they described them, right? <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, so the men, you know, the descriptions of the men are, are more realistic as well. They don't always have to be handsome. Character matters more in these, in these novels. What you work for matters more in these novels. Not just about virtue, right, and protecting your virtue, but who you are as a, as a person, um, what you hold dear. Contraception's widely used in these novels. You don't always end up knocked up at the end, uh, which is one of the, the tropes of the 1980s. It ends because she finds herself pregnant, they get married, then they live happily ever after, right? That's a lot of them. Whereas now, it's not necessarily the end. And a lot of the times, they're using you know, contraceptive measures that were, frankly, not existent, right? That they just kind of make up in their head, like this woman was an apothecary, and she figured out a sponge could be used, right? Uh, you know, so, so you know, they, you, again, you've got to twist those details to make these, these modern women who are reading these books and want to see that utopia in there. Right? Um, there's a wider variety of employment available to women. 
And uh, I was talking to Dr. Hendershot about a, a book the, uh, that included the Viking and the beekeeper, right? That uh, I, I used to torture him with, with the stories of, I felt like I was torturing him. He was very nice about it with stories of the romance novels I'd been reading over the past couple of months. And um, I came in one day and I said, my God, you are not going to believe the book I read last night. I mean, it was a historian's nightmare, right? And I don't expect these people to be professional. And I have to admit, some of these women who write these books know more about some of these periods than I ever did. They are very, very into their, their craft. And they sat there and did the research. And they do an amazing job of detail. But a lot of them, not so much. So I'm reading this. I, I got this ebook and I started reading it. And it's all about how a woman falls in love with a Viking prince, which I did not know they had those. And um, she, uh, they make a marriage contract together for her betterment. She has a kid. She's, um, good, I mean, just fantastically beautiful, of course. Uh, but she, she has a child, so it kind of falls in. This is kind of at that middle stage between the 80s and the period that, that I'm talking, you know, these new ones. And um, in a way, to try to give her something to do, to give her an occupation that's going to appeal to women, you can tell that the writer said, my god, what kind of occupation am I going to give somebody in Anglo-Saxon England, a woman? Right? So they make her a professional beekeeper. Right? <laughs> and the whole story is how she's protecting her bees. and. And there's whole segments where it's obvious that this writer went and did research on beekeeping. And she like tortures you with the details in the middle of this. And the hero is stung and it leads to a sex scene. It's very strange, right? <laughs> and, um, and so I was, I was, it was so funny because I think that that tells you how far the people will go to try to make these appealing to a modern audience, right? They're obviously, they know that they need to talk to career women that they need to make uh, the, these in any kind of circumstance, whether it's in Viking period or whether it's in Regency romance novels, where suddenly there are a rash of women writing Gothic romances. That's their, the character's uh, occupation. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I should also say, too, you know, kind of part of the storyline has changed. There's uh, new representations of non-traditional characters. Uh, for one thing, there's a general acceptance of homosexuality. Uh, uh, there are uh, references made in the medieval ones to people who, who do, uh, men who do prefer men. It's accepted by the heroes and the heroines um, as generally a part of, of sexuality. It, there, are, uh, there was actually just, in one, of the, in one of the funniest endings I think I've ever read in a romance novel, because it, it was so stereotypical about gay men, uh, the, the hero and the heroine decided to go visit his brother in the French countryside where he set up a chateau and winery with his lover, right? It's so stereotypical. It's right out of Top Chef. And, um, and so, uh, you know, but that's what gay men do. They buy chateaus and start vineyards, right? Uh, and so, uh, but there is this acceptance uh, of homosexual characters. Uh, there's also um, more African-American characters. Now, one of the interesting things that, that I would say is a, a good critique there still isn't inter interracial relationships, um, really in, in any inter-ethnic. Inter After the chic and this kind of period in the 1980s where you had a number of sheiks that start lining the grocery store shelves, um, of course, after 9-11, I mean, the romance novels reflect our society. After 9-11, sales um, on romance novels that are based in the Middle East plummet. Uh, but I. Uh, Non-traditional characters, there are a lot of African-American characters that don't, aren't just stereotypes. They're not just the, the slave on the plantation uh, who comes to occasionally give the, the master good advice, right? But rather, uh, there are characters who represent, um, there was, uh, I was just looking at one, and there was a, an African-American businessman uh, who, the, who the main hero was talking to on a regular basis. They were close friends. But we still don't have big publishing houses that are printing. Uh, romance novels for his, the Hispanic community and romance novels for the African American community. Uh, they're, it's basically seen as poison, that they're not going to make money off it. They don't want to try, right? even though they have a willing audience. I mean, the, the Hispanic community's love of telenovelas right, tell you that you have a, you have a ready community for escapist fiction, uh, but they don't want to risk the capital. Right? Um, and so there are some problems still left. And I have to say, you know, about masculinity and about the male character. In the 19th century, uh, th those works, a lot of the, the male characters, they weren't really well fleshed out. Uh, they were handsome. They were noble. They helped save the day. But you didn't really know these guys, right? You didn't get a sense there was any character development. 
it's really in the 1970s and 1980s they try and flesh these guys out. 1970s, 1980s, they tended to be pretty power hungry, uh, pretty domineering men. But it's, it's the new romances that are really struggling. And I, I would call it a schizophrenic representation of men because it reflects what women are kind of struggling with right now, what they want in a partner. Uh, the masculine characters are kind of, you know, for one thing, it used to be that, you know, in the 1970s and 1980s, the female character would do, you know, would, you'd go through the storyline, he would be attracted to her, she would be attracted to him, there'd be some kind of kidnapping, he'd save her, life goes on, everybody's happy. Um, he, you know, she reacted well to his domineering character, uh, right? He helps guide her in life, he helps save her. Right? Uh, in the 1990s, into the, the present day, you start to see a change in this. Uh, the men are put in the odd position of having to convince the women to marry them. Right? These women have careers. They are very busy. Those gothic novels don't write themselves, right? That beekeeping, it's a time consuming, apparently, as I learned. And I can educate you all about beekeeping next year, you know, if you're really interested in that. I won't. But so, uh, so you know, these men are actually having to chase these women and convince them to marry them. Right? They're actually having to make rational arguments to these women about, well, this is why I think it would be good if we got married. And the women actually turn them down a number of times. Right? They have better things to do. They make their own money. So this is reflecting the modern woman. Right? And a lot of these men, what, what, the reason I call them schizophrenic is the fact that you know, for one minute in the book, they're really domineering, but in the next minute, they're apologizing to her about being domineering. Right? One minute he won't pay attention to what she says, next minute he'll be paying, you know, explaining you know, his, his rationale for that and trying to get her to understand his side. So suddenly these male characters are forced into a position of explaining themselves, which is totally different than, uh, than the period before this. And that's just a few of the changes that I've seen, right? And I think that romance novels are really struggling, uh, particularly in these historic romance novels, to make these things uh, palatable to, to modern women. Um, so romance novels have been criticized for everything from upholding and disseminating patriarchy to generally rotting the brain of the general female population in the U.S. Yet they, like any representation of popular culture, um, the study of this genre, particularly after the 1930s, offers us a window on its demanding and voracious readership. As a genre targeted uh, largely or sorry, written largely by women for women, romance novels also are products of the periods in which they are written. Um, so from the action-focused chivalric epics in the 1100s uh, to the more liberal romances published recently, we get a sense of these societies and their basic understanding of gender roles and relationships between the sexes through an interpretation of their escapist literature. What is that world that they wanted to escape to? For the Victorians, it was a world where you were able to preserve your virtue and that you have power over your virtue and the preservation of that virtue. And that you yourself could have adventures. The hero, as I said before, was often a faceless prototype or a very dour, if you think about Heathcliff, right? Or, uh, or you know, the, the hero of Jane Eyre, very dour, brooding gentleman haunted by the mysteries of the past. For young writers publishing today, this world is an increasingly accepting place where men understand that women are equal and should be respected, where the women are self-supportive, sexually aggressive, and sexually satisfied, and expect to be sexually satisfied, and that the men are a kind of slightly confused balance of power, smarts, hotness, right, and respect for his partner. Now, this isn't to say that the genre is perfect, as I said before. Um, romance is still, I mean, they often end in marriage. There isn't kind of an ending for a romance novel that I've ever seen that just says, oh, okay, we're really happy in our relationship now. We'll talk about the future in the future, right? It always has to end with marriage. It's the ultimate happy ending in the minds of these writers for, uh, for relationships. Uh, the majority of works still uphold racial barriers. They aren't doing anything with, um, they aren't doing any interracial uh, relationships. There is a small publishing house, I think that publishes a few books a year, that, do, that does books with this topic. They're small Latino and African American printing presses, but again, they're not putting out very much. And the major printing houses seem to have absolutely no interest um, in publishing novels with non-white leading characters. 
They also don't publish, and I should say this from the beginning, there's been this focus on middle classness. You don't see books where the woman talks with a working class accent or is obviously a member of the working class. That's not attractive to the readership. Um, they want a woman who you know, is a career woman who rises in the ranks and marries a, a, you know, a duke and continues her career in the long run. I mean, that's the new story. So I should say, with the, with the exception of the obsession um, of the early 1900s and the 1980s with chics, as I said before, the, the genre remi remains pretty much lily white, um, although they do have this number of supporting characters who are not. So the big question is, is it feminist lit? Or is it just dreadful? Um, and and I, I would say that it, particularly the, you know, the new writers that are coming out now, I think you could call it feminist lit. I think they are pushing emancipation of women. I think they are pushing equality. And that's feminism. Uh, feminism is about understanding there should be equality between the sexes. And they are pushing this agenda. And I will say um, that if you look at the story of romance novels, you can see the increase in this consciousness for women. You can see them changing their mind about, you know, maybe my responsibility isn't just upholding my virtue for marriage, right? Because, hey, virginity was a commodity. It was worth money in this period. You had to be a virgin on the marriage bed. And so, rather than it being just about preserving that, by, by this period when we're in, it's about preserving yourself. Um, and so I do think that we can call it a feminist lit, whether or not we think that they're dreadfully written. And that's what I have today. Oh, I don't know how to get it off the thing. Shut up. <laughs> Questions, we'll use the microphone. Nice job, by the way. Oh, thank you. Uh, my name is Omar Arfin. And um, my question to you is, um, what do you think the status of romance in America is uh, compared to Europe? Because um, I've talked to a few Europeans, and they have a stereotype that uh, American guys are not as romantic. I. So that just a general status of romance in the, in the United States. Yeah, That's do you believe it's dying or? I think it's dying. Do I think it was ever there? <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I would say from what I've taught, I mean, I lived in Europe. And from what I, and, and talking to my European friends, um, there is this general stereotype that, that, um, that American men are more practical, right? And that European men live for passion right, and live for romance. I'm in a crowd full of American men here, man. <laughs> uh, I, I would say that I would say that there are different concepts of romance. That that for American men, it's about proving yourself. It's about um, it's about being practical. It's about proving that you can support people. It's about proving that you're honest. And that, whereas I think that for Europeans, there is this long tradition of the romantic, right, coming out of the the romantic period, Byron, Shelley, all of those people that really caught a hold and it's become part of the traditions there where it's about the moment, right? I think for American men, it's about the future. But for, for, for European men, it's more about the moment. That's what I would say. And, and I'm sure that there are a bunch of people who are like, I absolutely disagree, right? Well, thank you. Um, going off what you just said, do you think that American men aren't as driven because the female population doesn't demand it as much as they used to? As in, like, they don't really... Um, they don't want men to be romantic, do you think? I'm sure they do. I'm sure they just really don't expect it or demand it as much. So it's just not so really... So we need to be more insistent is what you're saying, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we need to come out with a list every year. No, not a list, but just, like, it's not really demanded, and they just... Doesn't seem like they really give a damn. So, <laughs> I think that's. I think that there there are plenty of women who expect men to be romantic. I'm not one of them. I mean, I forget my anniversary on a regular basis, and 
live my life with my head. And look, Mike Light is actually nodding and saying, actually, she talked to me about this, right? Uh, but, I, but I think it's just personally about the, the particular woman, right? But I do think that there's, there's a long line of, of romantic tradition in, in Europe where it's, it's much more, um, it's much more of a, I would say, a performance uh, for European men than it is for American men. Um, that it is something that you do. You have to show it, right, um, on a regular basis for European, for a lot of European men, particularly Southern Europeans, right? Southern France, Italy, um, Spain. Romania, where I lived. Uh, and so, so I think that there's just a difference in culture about showing. Right? There's different ways of showing that. Hi. <laughs> um, you mentioned that uh, Readership has an impact on, um, and the reader review has an impact on what the publishers will print. Mm -hmm. But do you think that um, th what is printed has had an impact on culture in general? Um, I don't, you know, escapist lit is really hard to, to quantify like that. Uh, because you're kind of looking at just escaping, right? You read these books really quickly and you just want to feel good by the end. I will say that one of the big critiques about romance novels is they always have a happy ending. And they teach people that your life's always going to end happily. How many people in this room think that, everything, that their life is always going to be happy? One. So I would say for that, most of us, we read escapist novels because we want to feel that one moment of, yeah, you're right, life is going to be happy. Then you shut the novel and say, oh, crap. And then you get on with your life, right? Uh, and, and so, but that's one of the complaints. The other complaint is, of course, that by, by giving these, uh, you know, those 1980s romance novels that, that tend to have very powerful dominant males in them who fix everything for the women, right? Start changing at the end of the 80s, but those early ones. Um, that those have an impact because it teaches women to expect men to be, that they should, that they should be saved by men, right? But other theorists say, and I, would, I think I would agree with the, the latter people, other theorists say that it's escapist lit. The reason that women are reading it is because they wouldn't mind occasionally having somebody lift part of the burden. But the women that are reading this are burdened. And they just want a moment to feel like somebody else is kind of lifting that load off their shoulders. And they shut the book and they realize how life is. I think women are more rational uh, than, to, than this, right? I think that what we can say about romance novels is that they do reflect society. And so by reading them, we can kind of get a signal about, you know, kind of a litmus test for, for society. They, now, they take a while to change. It takes about, you know, on average, it's looking like about seven, eight years. We'll see something happening in society, and we'll see it reflected in a romance novel. Because they are, it's all about money, right, and readership. You don't want to lose that readership. You don't want to lose that money. So they kind of test the waters a little bit to see if they should change, right? And slowly they do. And there are still, you go to a, you know, you do go to a grocery store today, there are still people who have been writing for 30 years. They're still writing the same books they were writing in the 1980s. And so, so not everybody has changed. But these new women that are writing, that are in their 30s or so, part of Generation X, they're putting out a whole new product um, that looks radically different for people. And there's also like new genres that go along with that, right? There's uh, the rom you know, not just romance novels, but chick lit, right? The Devil Wears Prada is a, is a great example of chick what's called chick lit, right? uh, which is an offensive term to, to begin with. But, uh, but uh, this idea that you write these, you know, these cleverly constructed novels about women in the contemporary world, right? That you inevitably turn in movies and make billions of dollars with, and so, uh, and so, you know, that genre. People have been complaining about that, right? That that this is giving a new message for women to only care about consumerism and fashion, or is it, or is it reflecting something that's already going on in society? And I would say that's what's going on. Consumerism is at an all-time high, right? Particularly in women. Right? Women are making their own money. They're buying $2,000 purses. Maybe not here, but they are in New York. And so, and so this is reflecting a trend that's already there. Um, and then that readership is coming from, from those people. Right? Very good, by the way. Oh. Um, do you think, 
women say they want the sensitive male, but looking at through the evolution of um, romance novels and such, mm -hmm. do you think the female reader is ready for the sensitive male subject in their... I mean, I haven't read any recently. What do you mean so. by sensitive male? Um, Does that exist? Feelings, crying, emotions. They don't do that. Mm -hmm. And I and I don't. I mean, does does anybody want a partner that cries all the time and is really emotional? No, men or, men or women. Do you know what I mean? I mean, the whole kind of mythology about the sensitive male is kind of odd uh, in in the United States because it's really funny if you see. Uh, if you see backlash against feminism, a lot of times they're like, well, women want sensitive men. That's the problem. They, they, want, they want this sensitive male. And I think what we see is that's not the case in these new romance novelists. These guys aren't crying. These guys aren't emotional. Uh, these guys, now occasionally they'll tear up and say somebody dies. Uh, but, uh, and, you know, that's okay. But, uh, but you don't see that. You, what you see is a more rational understanding of their relationship with their partner. And I think that that's what's getting reflected is that women do see themselves as equal. They do see themselves as, as a, a contributor um, to society. And therefore, they need a male character that respects that in the, in the heroine of the novel. Does that, does that answer your question? Do you, see, do you see it like in the future? In the future, having this sensitive, the, the idea of the sensitive male? No. No, I think they want it to be equal. I, I think that's what these, these novels are reflecting. And I think that's what you know most, most uh, even, you know, even polls that are taken. It's all about equality. It's not about kind of trying to, um, to, to create a, a very emotional male, but rather that, that you want it equal and a, you know, a relationship that's, that's on an equal keel and that, and that is comprised of people who respect each other right, and respect each other's abilities. And that's the cool thing about some of the new romance novels that I was shocked by, was that's the, the male characters that they're creating, right? rather than these dominant guys who rape women and uh, and, and, you know, beat them at times and, and who tell them what to do, but rather somebody who respects them. Did you, you had a question? Um, when you mention um, the new writers of the romance novels and um, how they often portray women as equal to men mm -hmm. and the women's kind of being their own mm -hmm. heroes in a way, um, are those novels mostly within the single title publications, or are there some within, like the like the Harlequin and like the major publishing houses? Well, the the publishing house themselves come up with the the regular romance novel and the singles. So that's just oh. genres within each, right? Okay. They're typically in the single, um, so the longer ones, right? Those three to four hundred page one where you have time for character development. That's where you really see them. And is there a difference in the kind of woman like who reads the single title publications as opposed to the you know, mass-produced ones, or not so much, or I don't see that much of a difference. Uh, it, you know, it, it's hard to say personally, but I mean, looking at the marketing reports and the polls that they've done, it seems to be the same people. Okay, yeah. that's a good question. Romance novels have to be within that genre, that that girl meets boy, that there's a work on the relationship, and the main focus on the book is on that relationship and building that relationship. And so when you get into historical fiction, a lot of the times they'll be focused on maybe a mystery, and then the romance is kind of to the side. That's not a romance. A romance novel has to be it's defined by the fact that your main discussion in that book is about the building of that relationship. And so, so when you get into, say, Nicholas Sparks, right, um, th that's a great example of somebody who, who writes male romance novels. Um, and the whole focus of the book, um, even though for a lot of people it's considered popular fiction, right, they wouldn't consider it a romance novel. But it's a romance novel because the whole story surrounds that relationship and the building of that relationship. Okay, so like the other Berlin girl and that kind of thing, they're romance novels. Yeah, they're romance yeah. novels, okay. yeah. And that's part of it, I think, a new, um, what happens in the late 80s and early 90s is actually people, famous romance novelists, uh, start to instead market to Harlequin or someplace like that that's just a publishing house for romance novels. They actually release it through a bigger publisher. And they become smash hits. Um, in some cases, other bowling girl, Philippa Gregory, is a romance novelist um, who, who published this <laughs> book and put it out through a different publishing house. And it hit the New York Times bestseller list. Sure. 
we should there you go sorry i'm sick um with other like or with like romantic comedies and like movies, is, are you seeing the same trends as like in uh, romance novels? Because they seem to follow like the same, like plot. But like what movie? I don't know. Any? Can you give me an example. Of what I you're can't think about? of anything right now. But like, <laughs> My, uh, believe me, Professor Light's back there raising his hand. So <laughs> apparently he can he can think of one of these. I thought he had a suggestion for a romantic film. He took no, I do, I do. Over spring break, my wife took me to see um, He's Not That Into You. All right. And I thought I had to be intoxicated to actually sit through this, but it, I wish that I had heard this lecture prior to going because it was a fascinating look at almost all the genres that you've talked about. There, There's this cast of female characters trying to figure out what it means to be in a relationship and what they're looking for in a partner and... Um, but some of it is so trite, like uh, Jennifer Aniston's character is in a long-term relationship with a guy who seems very committed and to, to seem to be an upstanding guy, but he just refuses to get married. And you mentioned that all these romance novels seem to end in a marriage. It wouldn't be a good genre to figure out um, or to study marriage trends and what was li life was like after marriage. Marriage is always the end of the story, right? Mm -hmm. And in this case, her character actually wins out. She wants to get married. It's the woman that's constantly pushing for a marriage, and then finally he gives in, and it's, a, it's supposed to be a happy moment. That's and good, I was that's pissed. That's a good basis for a relationship, right? Yeah, now. well, you know, I mean, he, he had, I thought it was a really telling um, discussion about the validity of marriage itself and what that means in a society. And, and so there are a lot of these romantic comedies, or something like The Bachelor that can actually be as popular as it is today, where you have... A, you know, a whole host of women, you know, fawning over this one guy, and that's the goal is to, you know, or which rock one of, of love. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I, I'm I curious about that. If, if you ever have encountered a romance novel where the end result is not marriage, or is that always a part of the formula? Always part of the formula. And so from what I've seen, they, they, the ending happily for a romance novel means ending in marriage. Yeah. Interesting. Hi. Um, well, keep in mind I'm not a romance novel fan. Sure um, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> but I've noticed that there's um, like a growing, uh, like a romance novel, like a romance uh, market to uh, like teenage girls, like uh, books like Twilight. And uh, are you worried that um, it could give uh, the wrong impression to teenage girls, like? Uh, like they could think that all men are sparkly, shiny, bipolar vampires. You were in my room the other day. Weren't you in there when I actually yeah, said I was. That Twilight was going to cause a downfall of humanity? Yep. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, Apologies to all Twilight fans, by the way. <laughs> yeah, no one's allowed to kill me after this. Yeah. Uh, I would say <laughs> Twilight. I could have given a paper on Twilight. <laughs> I, I think it is quite possibly the most craptastic. <laughs> <laughs> novel, a group of a group of books that, that I've ever seen. It's so bad, it's just brilliantly good. And um, <laughs> and so I would say that there is, on the side of, of this change in romance novels, there are certain things that I'm starting to see come up about young adult fiction, like Twilight, which it terrifies me that Twilight's a young adult, mm -hmm. but um, that, that are coming up that are starting to focus on this domination of the female character again. Right? He put, I mean, part of Twilight, right? Spar sparkly vampires, which we can't even get into that. But uh, they sparkle in the sunlight, if you didn't know that. But um, <laughs> that's why they can't go out during the day. <laughs> <laughs> and they're also uh, vegetarian vampires. They're, they're like, right? yeah. Yeah. I, d I didn't actually, I, my friend saw the movie, so I didn't. I like how it's like, it's not me, it was my friend. I totally watched the movie. I almost went on opening night. I'd be too I ashamed. Loved, I loved it. I wasn't. I was hooting with the 14-year-olds. Uh, but, uh, but uh, you know, I think that for Twilight, that it, you know, I mean, for, for one thing, like, it, to talk about dominance in, the, in these young adult novels, that, for instance, he decides she can't go visit her friends at one point, so he actually pulls, I think, her break lines or something like that. He, he makes sure he, she, or her, not her break lines, that would kill her, wait. <laughs> her battery lines. No, but he, but Edward does, too. 
No, her dad does it in the first novel, but Edward does it in the second, right? Third. You're like, third. you're wrong. <laughs> it's just your mom? That's why you knew about book three, huh? Yeah, and so, so, you know, I mean, but there is this domination of the female character there. She's not even remotely interested in her friends. So, as she, you know, she makes these friends at her new school. Then she just completely stops talking uh, um, to her friends, right? So there are these undertones in young adult fiction that's a little bit concerning to me, which is why I call Twilight the downfall of humanity, and no one's allowed to accost me later. I'm scared of Twilight fans, I got to say. Yeah, I've read there's, like, um, like people get stabbed and killed and... Yeah, well, like somebody like had glass question, thrown in their eye. Have to get a police like there's a whole list on the internet of like uh, attacks by Twilight fans. Like, uh, by Twilight. yeah, like somebody got a swirly, like and then with somebody had like ground up glass thrown in their eye, and then somebody got stabbed. Yeah, so thanks for asking that yeah. question. I, yeah. I really appreciate. Uh, right. I'm gonna need a police escort out of here at the at the end of the tunnel. Hi. Um, you mentioned earlier that uh, chiclet is kind of a derivative of this mm -hmm. genre. Do you feel like it might be um, targeted towards a younger readership? And uh, if so, or regardless, I guess, of, of who it's targeting, um, do you feel that that can also be feminist literature? Sure. I, I mean, to answer your last question first, so yeah, I definitely think that it can be feminist literature, right? Uh, think about The Devil Wears Prada. I think it's so how the book ends, right? She doesn't end up with the guy at the end of the book, right? They're just trying to be friends, you know? And so, so that, you know, I, I think that it, and I'm not saying that's part of feminism, you never get the guy, right? But, but, I, but I think that it's part of the genre because it does focus a little bit on romance, but think about what else that book focuses on. Her career, her relationship with another woman, her relationship with her friends, and how she almost destroys that relationship, right? And so I think that some, I won't say all of them, the Shopaholic series kind of scares me, right? Mm -hmm. Because of the mass consumerism in it. Devil Wears Prada, of course, there's consumerism in it, but she's working for a fashion house. Shopaholic series is just because you like to shop, right? And so I, and so, so I think there are some concerns there about how do you make yourself feel better? You go buy something. Right? That, that's what's going to make you feel better. Uh, but I think that there, in some of this, you know, quote unquote, chiclet, I think that there is this development of characters and young women thinking about themselves. I don't know that it definitely, I think that uh, if I'm not mistaken, that genre targets 20 to 30 year olds. And, I, and especially for paranormal romances, uh, they target about the same, same age group, right? So, uh, so I think it's kind of a, the same readership that's crossing over. Not admitting that they read the, the Bodice Rippers, right? But admitting that they read The Devil Wears Prada. And I think that's it, right? Thank you very much. Thanks for your questions, it was fun.